Well, good morning, church. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and our Lord Jesus Christ. Um, as we turn to the Lord in his word, let's take a few moments to bow in prayer. Uh, Father in heaven, we uh, just want to start off by saying thank you. Uh, thank you for um, Brother Steve Van Horn and just that announcement, 50 years, Lord, of, of partnering with our church and others as well, Lord, over the years. We thank you for um, his faithfulness, uh, Lord, and uh, all the work uh, that item does, Lord, in equipping pastors to to transform and change the world there in Africa, Lord, and we pray your continued blessing on it. Father, as we continue our worship in your word, as we uh, enter into a week of thanksgiving, we just pray that you'd prepare our hearts and our minds for the truths therein. Lord, what we know not teach us, what we have not give us, and who we are not, who we are not in Christ, we ask that you'd make us, and we ask it all in Jesus' name, amen. Uh, there was a, a little boy who was uh, asked to pray for the meal before dinner. Uh, before closing his eyes, he took a look at the food that was prepared. He then bowed his head and he said this, Lord, I don't like the looks of it, but Lord, I'm going to thank you and I'm going to eat it anyways. Uh, you know, as we enter into a week of Thanksgiving, Maybe there are some of you, as, as you take a look at this past year, as you consider some of the circumstances that you're facing as you enter into this week of Thanksgiving, maybe that's your prayer as you pray the same prayer, Lord, I don't like the looks of it, but I'm going to thank you and I'm going to praise you anyway. Uh, this morning, I want to take some time to talk about how to cultivate an attitude of gratitude in troubled times. And I'd like to suggest this morning that this message is relevant to all of us, whether you walked in burdened or you walked in blessed, because if you can thank him in the valley, you can thank him in, thank him in a greater way on the mountaintop. If you can thank him in the hard times, you can thank him in the good times. And if you can thank him in the midst of the storms, you better believe that you can thank him when the clouds have cleared. How do you cultivate an attitude of gratitude? especially in troubled times. If there was someone that we could turn to who could answer that question, it's the Old Testament prophet Habakkuk. We've been walking through uh, the, the book of Habakkuk, just three chapters long, and by the time that we get to the end of the book, Habakkuk is a changed man. His circumstances, ha circumstances have not changed. His circumstances have not shifted. The nation of Judah is going to be taken captive and exiled by the Babylonians. There is not, they are not, he's living in troubled times. But what has changed is his worry has been transformed into worship as he stands back and on wonder at the word of God that declares the glory of God in light of the judgment of God that's coming upon Judah and will one day come upon the Babylonians where God will hold the Babylonians to account and then one day deliver his people. And so Habakkuk is the guy that we're going to talk about. How do you cultivate an attitude of gratitude in troubled times as we consider in chapter 3 his prayer that's attached to a song? his declaration of praise. So would you stand in honor of the reading of the word as we consider how to cultivate an attitude of gratitude. The text begins a prayer of Habakkuk the prophet on Shigianoth. O Lord, I have heard your speech and was afraid. O Lord, revive your work in the midst of the years. In the midst of the years, make it known. In wrath, remember mercy. God came from Taman, the Holy One, from Mount Paran, Selah. His glory covered the heavens and the earth was full of his praise. His brightness was like the light. He had rays flashing from his hand and, and there his power was hidden. Before him went pestilence and fever followed at his feet. He stood and measured the earth. He looked and startled the nations and the everlasting mountains were scattered. The perpetual hills bowed. His ways are everlasting. I saw the tents of Kushan in affliction. The curtains of the land of Midian trembled. O oh Lord, were you displeased with the rivers? Was your anger against the rivers? Was your wrath against the sea that you rode on your horses, your chariots of salvation? 
Your bow was made quite ready. Oaths were sworn over your arrows, Selah. You divided the earth with rivers. The mountains saw you and trembled. The, the overflowing of the water passed by. The deep uttered its voice and lifted its hands on high. The sun and moon stood still in the, their habitation. At the light of your arrows they went, at the shining of your glittering spear. You marched through the land in indignation. You trampled the nations in anger. You went forth for the salvation of your people. For salvation with your anointed, you struck the head from the house of the wicked by laying bare from foundation to neck, Salem. You thrust through with his, you thrust through with his own arrows the head of his villages. They came out like a whirlwind to scatter me. Their rejoicing was like feasting on the poor in secret. You walked through the sea with your horses, through the heap of great waters. When I heard, my body trembled, my lips quivered at the voice. Rottenness entered my bones, and I trembled in myself, that I might rest in the day of trouble. When he comes up to the people, he will invade them with his troops. Though the fig tree may blossom, nor fruit be on the vines, though the labor of the olive may fail, and the fields yield no food, though the flock may be cut off from the fold, and, and there be no herd in the stalls, yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will joy in the God of my salvation." The Lord God is my strength. He will make my feet like deer's feet. And he will make me walk on high hills to the chief musician with my stringed instruments. The word of the Lord, you all may be seated in the presence of God this morning. As we get to walk through our text together, the book of Habakkuk began with a prophet who was greatly troubled, who was worried. He was wrestling with questions that some of us wrestle with. Yet he asked them of the Lord, questions that maybe some of you have asked, maybe some of you have wanted to ask, questions like, Lord, when and why concerning the will of God? At the beginning of the book, he took a look at the current spiritual state of the nation, and he saw a decline spiritually and, and morally, and he said, Lord, why don't you do something? When are you going to hold your people accountable? The Lord answered and broke the divine silence and said, I am doing something. You won't even believe it. I'm raising up the Babylonians. They're going to come in and they're going to bring judgment upon Judah. They're going to bring divine discipline. And Habakkuk asks another question he's struggling with. Lord, why do you have to use them? Lord, why do you have to do it that way? And the Lord answered, and this is the revelation, the word of God that transforms his worry into worship. The Lord declares that in a glorious way, he's going to bring judgment upon the Babylonians, and eventually, he's going to bring salvation to his people Judah, who have been taken captive. And now Habakkuk, in chapter 3, stands back in awe and wonder at the greatness of his God, and in this prayer that's put to a song, this praise that is a hymn, we get to see how you and I can cultivate an attitude of gratitude even in troubled times because while his circumstances haven't changed, he has changed. He's no longer walking by sight, he's walking by faith. He's, he's living according to the promises of God. He's not living according, according to the explanations that he thinks he needs or that he thinks he's entitled to. Because God doesn't give him explanations to his questions. God gives him a greater revelation of himself. And Habakkuk stands back in chapter 3 in awe and wonder. And the manner in which we cultivate an attitude of gratitude in those troubled times is by means of our reverence of God. As you take a look at Habakkuk's greater view of the glorious God who, who sends for its judgment and will one day deliver his people Habakkuk, in the first two verses, stands back in reverential awe at his God. How do you reverence God? The first thing I'd like to suggest is, is we're invited to reverence God in, in light of our ability to have a conversation with him. I mean, take a look at verse 1 in Habakkuk chapter 3. It says, a prayer of Habakkuk the prophet on Shiganoth. Um, Habakkuk has told us some great things about the Lord, especially in this chapter. Uh, his glory fills the heavens. His praises fill the earth. 
He, he shines with the brightness of the sun and he, he holds lightning bolts in his hand and yet he's willing to have an honest conversation with this guy named Habakkuk and allow him to ask his questions. That should cause you to stand back in reverential awe and wonder and say, God, that the fact that I can have an honest conversation with you causes me to, 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 to wonder at how you allow me to do that. I mean, I don't know about you, but the question, one, one of the questions we've asked is, is, are we even allowed to ask those questions of when and why concerning the will of God? Habakkuk did, and he seems, seemed like it worked out okay for him. And once again, he responds to the revelation of the Lord, and he reacts with this declaration of praise through this prayer that's attached to music, and we get to see this conversation Continue. Reverence God in light of our ability to simply have a conversation with him, be honest with him, and then allow our worry to be transformed into worship. Our frustrations in light of his word be transformed into faith. You know, our concerns that we once had get transformed into confidence as we get to see it declared in chapter three. Reverence God in light of our ability to have a conversation with him. It says in, on Shig, Shiganoth in verse 1, we don't know exactly what that means, but we do know it's probably a musical marker of sorts, which reminds us that this prayer is attached to a song. The purpose of this prayer is a, a psalm of, of praise as, as Habakkuk declares it, and we get to hear it and also sing along with it. As we, as we cultivate an attitude of gratitude, even in those troubled times. So reverence God in light of our ability to have a conversation with him, but also reverence God in light of his name. In verse two, Habakkuk uh, uh, approaches and addresses God two times as, O Lord. O Lord, I have heard your speech and was afraid. O Lord, revive your work in the midst of the years. When you stand back in reverential awe at the name of God, we're reminded that the name of God reveals the nature of God. When it says, O Lord, there, it's a reminder that's the covenant-keeping name of God. We're reminded that God is a God. He is the Lord who makes promises, and he is the Lord who keeps his promises. He's the Lord who revealed himself to Abraham and set Abraham apart to himself to make him a great nation and promised him land, seed, and blessing. This is the Lord who makes promises and who keeps his promises. This is the Lord who revealed himself to Moses in the burning bush. And when he sent Moses to deliver the people from the, uh, the oppressive hand of the Egyptians, he said, tell them I am has sent you. I am that I am. He's the God who makes promises and he's the one who keeps his promises. And all the promises of old will be fulfilled in the person and work of Jesus Christ. The Lord is the one who makes promises and the Lord is the one who keeps his promises. Can I invite you in light of thanksgiving to cultivate a heart of thanksgiving as you stand back in reverential awe and wonder at the greatness of the Lord Yahweh who makes promises and keeps his promises and fulfills all promises in the person and work of Jesus Christ. He came the first time as a suffering servant. He's coming the second time as the conquering king. And then thirdly, we are invited to stand back in, in reverential awe and wonder in light of his word. Habakkuk says this, O Lord, I have heard your speech and was afraid. When you, we stand for the word of God in, in reverence of God's word, but, but how many of us, if you stand but you, your heart is not submitted and, and your heart is not in reverential awe of the greatness of God who has revealed it, you know, I mean, how much reverence should we show God in his word? Great reverence. The fact that he has given us his word and revealed himself through it, that we can know a holy, righteous God, the creator of heaven and earth is amazing. In Habakkuk, we get to see he says, in light of your word, the declaration of judgment that's to come, that demonstrates your glory in which you are going to hold Babylon and hold them to account and you're going to judge them and one day deliver your people. Habakkuk says, I, I, I stand back in reverential awe and wonder. 
but also uh, reverence God, not just in light of his words, but also in light of his works. Habakkuk says in verse two, he says, O Lord, revive your work in the midst of the years. He says, Lord, in the same way you've worked in the past, through the exodus of Egypt and through the conquest of Canaan, do it again. Lord, in the same way that you worked in the past, revive your work among your people. God, as you hold your people to account and, and you bring judgment upon Judah, but one day will bring judgment upon Babylon and deliverance to your people, Lord, do it again. And so he stands back in reverential awe and wonder at the works that God has once done. And he asks him, Lord, do it again. The God that we worship and serve is the same God yesterday, today, and forever. He is the everlasting God. And Habakkuk says, do it again. Do it in our time, in the midst of the years, make it known. And then he says this in verse 2, in wrath, remember mercy. God, as you reveal your wrath and bring the Babylonians in to judge Judah, Lord, also reveal your mercy. Is it possible to see a good picture of what it looks like to see wrath revealed and mercy revealed? You know, the perfect place where you see the wrath of God revealed and the mercy of God, mercy of God revealed is at the cross. At the cross where Jesus died where the wrath of God was satisfied. At the cross, what Christ was doing on that cross was bearing the sins of humanity, your sins and mine, past, present, and future. And he took upon himself the wrath of God against our sin. And God's wrath was revealed. But there at the cross, his mercy was revealed against sinful humanity because through the substitutionary atonement of Jesus Christ who took our place, where Christ received wrath, he has shown you and I mercy. And for that, we should stand back in reverential awe and wonder at the greatness of our God. The significance of thanksgiving is not just about what we are thankful for, but the one that we are thankful to. And in the first two verses, we're reminded of the one that we are thankful to. One that we stand back in reverential awe and wonder and take a look at the fact that we can have a personal relationship with him. We can have an ongoing conversation with him. That's amazing. That we should take a look at his name as he's revealed himself as the covenant-keeping God, a God who makes promises and keeps his promises, and a God who has revealed himself in his word and in his work. As you sit around the table or as you have conversations, take the opportunity to thank God for who he is, for how he has revealed himself to you. I want to invite you to thank God this Thanksgiving that you and I can have a personal relationship with him. You can enter into his presence at any moment of, of any day. You enter into his presence in the name of Jesus. He's intensely personal, God. Take time to, to thank him, not just that he's personal, but that his name means something that his name reveals his nature and that he's a God who has made promises and he keeps his promises. And when you take a look at the troubled times in your life and the troubled times going on in the world around you, you can take a step back in awe of wonder and say, thank you, God, that you are the King of kings and the Lord of lords. Even when all things in this world or in my life seem like they're falling apart, I just want to take the opportunity to thank you because you're holding it all together. Take time to thank him for his word as we get to declare it and teach it on a Sunday morning or study it during the week or open it during a devotional. How precious to us is the word of God that we have access to it and take time to thank God for the work that he has done through the person and work of Jesus Christ in revealing both his mercy and revealing both his wrath. Stand back in awe and wonder at this reverential, at, at this God who we are to stand, who we are to worship with reverential awe and wonder. So first, how do you cultivate an attitude of gratitude even in troubled times? By means of our reverence of God. Secondly, by remembering the works of God in verses 3 
to 15. Now, as Habakkuk began in verse 2, he says, Lord, uh, the work that you've done in the past, Lord, do it again. Lord, as I reflect on the exodus of Exodus from Egypt or the conquest of Canaan, as you led your people into the promised land, Lord, do it again. As you bring judgment upon Judah, and one day will bring judgment upon Babylon, and then will deliver your people after 70 years, Lord, do it again. And Habakkuk takes the opportunity to remember and to recall the work of God. This Thanksgiving, we're invited to recall the work of God, uh, not just in our lives or this past year, or this past week, but the work of God through Scripture that is revealed. <laughs> As we take a, an opportunity to consider not just a God we are thankful to, but also what, what we are thankful for concerning what God has done. As Habakkuk walks us through verses 3 to 15, what he does is he describes the work God has done in the past and, and he hopes that God will do it again. In verse, verses 3 uh, to 4, he reveals or describes the the works of God that describe his greatness. In verse three, it says, God came from Taman, the holy one from Mount Paran, uh, Selah. Uh, uh, what this picture is here is the Lord coming from the south. Um, uh, Taman and Mount Paran are in the direction of Sinai. And it pictures what God has done as he's led his people from Sinai into the promised land as he gives them victory over their enemies, and as he blesses them with the promise that he said he will give them. And Habakkuk says this, he says, God came from Taman. He is the great and glorious God. And, and, and you know, as the Lord was with his people, as they entered into the promised land, as we're going to see in a moment, the nations are, are stricken with fear. And what Habakkuk is is describing the Lord as, as, as one who is in his greatness and glories is coming from the south once again. And then it, and then it says the word, word Selah. The word Selah there is a musical marker, but the purpose of that musical marker is for us to just pause and to ponder. I mean, just picture this for a moment as, as God comes from the south in his glory and in his greatness as he accompanies his people so that they might receive the promises of God. This little nation that has, that has been under, um, under the oppression of, of, of Egypt for 400 years is led out into the wilderness to Mount Sinai and then into the promised land and the greatness and the glory of God is on display. Stand back and ponder that. What a beautiful, wonderful scene that we see considering God. And then it describes his greatness and his glory in light of nature. His glory covered the heavens and the earth was full of his praise. <laughs> this speaks of the greatness and the glory of God in which the glory of God fills the heavens. The greatness of God, the heaviness of God fills the heavens and his praises fill the earth. Uh, we should be able to see this in the church this morning. Because we're just so thankful that our God is so good. Our, our church should be filled with the, with the praises of his people. And then it describes him in light of nature. His brightness was like the light. He shines as brightly as the sun. You can barely look at him. It says, and he had rays flashing from his hands. Now these could be describing uh, rays of sunshine. But it could also be describing lightning bolts in his hands. And so you see the glory and the greatness of God who shines brightly like the sun, who holds thunderbolts in his hands. And then it says, and there his power was hidden. His brightness not just reveals his glory, his brightness conceals fully who God is in all of his glory. So first, Habakkuk describes the, recalls the, the work of God that describes his greatness, but also in verses five to seven, the work of God that describes his power. Verse five says, before him went pestilence and fever followed at his feet. Uh, Habakkuk recalls how the Lord in his power sends plagues and pestilence. In delivering the children of Israel from the oppressive hand of the Egyptians, God displays his power in these plagues. 
In Revelation 6, we see before the coming of Jesus Christ the second time, there are going to be plagues that are evident in a real way. And this is what you see, how God is described here. And then it speaks of his power. It says that he stood and measured the earth. (laughs) Sometimes we have a kind of a small view of God. God is great. He's the creator. We are the creation. When you take a look at God and he takes a look at earth with his all-seeing eye, he simply takes a look at the earth and he can measure it in a moment's time. He created it. He he looked and startled the nations and the everlasting mountains were, were scattered. Anyone have a teacher who in school all she had to do or he had to do was look at you and it struck fear in you? This is the way the Lord is described here. The Lord simply looks at the nations and they stand back stricken with fear. This is how great our God is. You know, we forget as we read chapter two, God is sovereign over the nations. God is sovereign over time. At the appointed time, the Babylonians will receive their judgment. And God is sovereign over the rulers over over the earth. We take a look at the superpowers of our day or we take a look at the superpowers of their day, whether it be Assyria or the Babylonians or Medo-Persia or the Roman, whoever it might, the Greeks. And God is sovereign over the nations. We're reminded of the greatness of our God. All he has to do is look at them and they are stricken with fear because of who God is. Puts things into perspective. The power of God is displayed. The everlasting mountains were scattered. You know those mountains that cannot be moved? God can scatter them like dust. He just blows them away. This is the sovereignty of God over nations and nature. It says the perpetual hills bowed, his ways are everlasting. The everlasting God is described as one with everlasting ways that are even beyond human comprehension. I saw the tents in Kushan, the the curtains of the land of Midian trembled. It continues to speak of the fear-stricken nations like Kushan and Midian. These are those who dwell in tents and so they are nomadic people and so they travel here or there, but they are stricken with fear in light of the power of God. Habakkuk describes the work of God uh, that is expressed in, in his power and that describes his glory and his greatness. But then in verses 8 to 15, that describes also his wrath and his mercy, his judgment and his salvation. In verses 8 to 15, Habakkuk pictures God as a mighty warrior who goes through the earth and brings judgment upon the nations, who tremble in his presence, and he brings salvation to his people. Habakkuk recalls this, verse 8, O Lord, Were you displeased with the rivers? He asks a series of questions. Was your anger against the rivers? Was your wrath against the sea that you rode on your horses, your chariots of salvation? Your bow was made quite ready. Oaths were sworn over your arrows. Selah, take a moment to pause and and ponder. Now, verse 8, he could be talking about a couple different things. He could be talking about the sovereignty of God over nature. In regards to the Lord who comes forth and the waters, he describes his wrath against them. It could also describe if it's being used figuratively in light of verse 12, if the waters are representative of the nations who are the enemies of God's people, uh, God is speaking of his wrath against them. But regardless, our entire text paints God as a mighty warrior, sovereign over nature and over nations. Verse 9 continues, you divided the earth with rivers. It's speaking of flash floods. I mean, when the rivers are flowing because of the downpour and the torrential rains, the Lord is sovereign over nature. The mountain saw you and trembled. The mountain shake in fear of the greatness and the grandeur of our Lord. The overflowing of the water passed by. And then it describes the sea, the deep, uttered its voice and lifted its hands on high. It pictures the sea and the waves of the sea and the waves are pictured as hands and and the image here is of the waves that are rising as hands that are crying out to God for mercy. They're saying, Lord, we surrender the sovereignty of God over nations and over nature. And then in verse 11, the sun and moon stood still in their habitation. 
in light of the glorious brilliance of God, who is a mighty warrior with his shiny arrows and his shiny spear, the moon and the, and the, and the sun stand still. You talk about some, some powerful images here as we consider the glorious greatness, grandeur of our God. He is sovereign over nature and nations. Verse 12, you march through the land in indignation. It speaks of his wrath and his judgment coming. You trampled the nations in your anger. You went forth for the salvation of your people, for salvation with your anointed. You struck the head from whose from the house of the wicked by laying bare from the foundation to the next Selah. Not only is there a revelation of wrath concerning the works of God, but there is a revelation of mercy and the future salvation of his people. Judah will one day be delivered from the hand of the Babylonians. They will return and their ultimate salvation will come in the person and work of Jesus Christ. Selah. Let's just pause and ponder that for a moment. And then verse 14, you thrust through with his own arrows the head of his villages. They came out like a whirlwind to scatter me. Their rejoicing was like feasting on the poor in secret. You walk through the sea with your houses through the heap of great waters. Verses 3 to 15, Habakkuk takes the moment to recall the works of God to recall the works of God that display his greatness, his glory, his power, his victory, his salvation, and his judgment that will come. This Thanksgiving, we're invited not just to to, to know who we are thankful for, but, but what we are thankful for. The great works of God displayed through redemption history. And the same God we worship and serve as as we get to read the great works of the Lord and the word of God declared to us, we have an opportunity to thank God for the great work that he has done ultimately in the person and work of Jesus Christ. And so if I could give you a couple takeaways as we thank God for what he has done, the first one is, is take time to thank him for the work he has done in your life. Take time to thank God for the salvation he has brought you if you know Jesus as your Savior and your Lord. Uh, Take time to think back throughout this year. How has God blessed you? Uh, I've said it before, you know, if you've got a house over your head and you've got clothes on your back, everything else is just extra. We have so much to be thankful to God for. Count your blessings, name them one by one. We sing that. Can we take an opportunity to reflect on it? To write it down, Lord, you've been so good to me this year. When I take a look at the things you, you've protected me from, as I consider the family that you, you've given me, when I look at the home that we have or the, 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 the roof over our head, the clothes on our back, Lord, all I can say is thank you. Take time to reflect on the works and the, that God has done in your life this year as you take time to tell God thank you. And then secondly, take time to share the works of God that he's done in your life with others. When God's been so good to you, you can't keep it to yourself. Pastor Greg earlier told us, maybe some of us will be sitting around the table and we're gonna say what we're thankful for. That's one way to share what God has done in your life and that what God continues to do in your life. I don't know about you, but I was saved early in life, six or seven years old, but I know God's been active in my life both then and now. And there's so much God has done and there's so much more that God continues to do. Today, we got to hear an update from our brother Steve Van Horn and consider the work that he has been doing in Africa through item and the pastors that are being trained and and the new initiatives that are being brought and and the young people, the youth who who are going to be trained in apologetics and are going to hear the gospel of Jesus Christ in the midst of it as the next generation is raised up. And we can't help as a church to say we've been able to partner with them for 50 years to stand back and say, God, thank you. God, continue to do a work that you have already begun. 
Lord, as, as you move your, your people around, your workers around, we want to take the opportunity to tell you thank you. So how do you cultivate an attitude of gratitude in troubled times, but also in those treasured times? Uh, by means of your reverence of God, by means of remembering the works of God, both revealed in Scripture and the works of God present in your life as God continues to do a good work. And then thirdly, this morning, as we wrap up the chapter and wrap up the book and wrap up our time by rejoicing in the Lord. What we're going to see is that while Habakkuk's circumstances have not changed, he has. He's not walking by sight, he's walking by faith. He's living on the promises of God. He's not living in accordance with the explanations he thinks he deserves or he thinks that he is entitled to. But Habakkuk stands back in reverential awe and wonder at the greatness of God and he says, I choose to rejoice. I want you to read verse 16 because before we get to verses 17 to 20, he describes his terror before he describes his trust. Verse 16 says this. It says, when I heard... My body trembled. What is Habakkuk talking about? He's talking about his reverential awe and wonder, but he knows judgment is coming to his people, Judah. He knows that the nation is going to be exiled. He knows that the temple is going to be destroyed and the city of Jerusalem will be no more. How do you worship the Lord in light of the events that are about to come? Judgment is upon them. And Habakkuk is shaking in terror and in fear. He says, my lips quivered at the voice. Habakkuk hears the word of the Lord and his lips quiver. His body trembles and decay and rottenness enter his bones. Habakkuk is speaking of the pain that he feels in light of the judgment that is about to come. His circumstances have not changed, but his outlook has. Then he says that I might rest in the day of trouble. In chapter 2 is interesting because the way that the Babylonians were described were those who, who had an insatiable desire for conquest. They were a restless people. They would conquer one nation and they couldn't enjoy that. They had to conquer some more. There are some people in this world who have so much, but they don't have time to enjoy it because they haven't been given the ability to do just that. Habakkuk says, in my trouble, I want to find rest in you. Is there anybody troubled? As you take a look at your circumstances right now, as you look at the difficulties you face, maybe a diagnosis that you've received, maybe it's a disagreement within a relationship within your family, among your friends, or in the workplace. Maybe it's the death of a loved one and the loss of a loved one. And, and you're entering into this week knowing that one of the chairs is going to be empty, and whether that chair has been empty for the first time or it's been empty for decades, the wound is still fresh. And so as you enter into the holidays, and they can be difficult for many of us, and you would say, yes, I'm a bit troubled. May you find rest in your trouble, choosing to rejoice in the Lord. And I trembled in myself that I might rest in the day of trouble. When he comes up to the people, he will invade them with his truth. Habakkuk said, I am in a state of terror. I am terrified because God is going to bring judgment upon our people, Judah. But he's got a greater plan and purpose in light of who he is as he's going to accomplish his redemption plan that's ultimately fulfilled in Jesus Christ. So first we see his terror that is described and then we see his trust that is proclaimed. We see his concern that is shared. And then we see his confidence that is declared. Verse 17, though the fig tree may not blossom, nor fruit be on the vines, though the labor of the olive may fail and the fields yield no food. I want you to know this is an agrarian society. And so what we're talking about, maybe in your language, is, is though the economy should crash... Though the gas prices should rise, six, seven, eight dollars and continue to go on up. Though we lose everything we have, our way of life, our homes, everything we know. He says, and the fields yield no food, though the flock may be cut off from the fold and there be no herd in the stalls. <laughs> though the interest rates on homes continue to rise and inflation seems to be overwhelming. 
Whatever trouble you face in the world and whatever trouble you face in your life, Habakkuk said, there is terror before me. My circumstances haven't changed, but my outlook has. Habakkuk says, yet I will rejoice in the Lord. May that be your commitment today. I will rejoice in the Lord. Though I lose everything in my life, I lose everything that I think is desirable in this world, yet I will rejoice in the Lord. He will, the Lord God, I will joy in the God of my salvation. The Lord God is my strength. He will make my feet like deer's feet. He will make me walk on my high heels to the chief musician with stringed instruments. Uh, rejoice in the Lord. That, that's the takeaway. What an amazing journey we've been on. We, we started with a, a, a prophet who had questions, who was worried, who was frustrated, who was concerned, but the word of God turned his worry into worship. And he said, even though I lose all this, I will choose to rejoice in you. I don't know what you're facing today. I don't know the concerns that are on your mind, the frustrations that are on your heart, the loss that you have experienced, the tragedies that you've had to go through. But I can know this. For those of us who know the Lord, we can choose to rejoice. If I could give you a couple of takeaways, the first one would be this. Make the choice to rejoice. Make the choice to rejoice Helen Keller once said, so much has been given to me that I have no, po- no time to ponder that which I don't have. <laughs> You're so focused on, on counting your blessings and naming them one by one, it's interesting how your complaints and your concerns uh, are no more in light of the many blessings that God has blessed you with. Joni Erickson Tata, who is a quadriplegic, said this, giving thanks is not a matter of feeling thankful, it is a matter of obedience. Make the choice to rejoice. When you wake up in the morning and you have nothing to be thankful for, let me tell you, you have someone to be thankful to. And if you have salvation and nothing else, you have a reason to rejoice in the glory of God and what he has provided each one of us. Make the choice to rejoice. Secondly, rejoice in the salvation that God has provided. Habakkuk says, I'm going to take joy in knowing that while the Babylonians have come to exile Judah and be an instrument of divine discipline now, I know that one day at the appointed time, God will bring salvation to his people. How much more the salvation that we have from our greatest enemy, not just nations who are enemies, but our greatest enemy of sin, death, and Satan and Christ has defeated all three at the cross. We have salvation. Then we have no reason to, 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 to find ourselves throwing pity parties. We have a reason to rejoice in the God of our salvation who has provided us everlasting life and the forgiveness of sins. I will choose to rejoice in the Lord of my salvation. Rejoice in the salvation God provides. Rejoice in the strength that God provides. It says our feet will be like deer's feet, as he provides strength, as, as you run, and you don't, 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 don't grow weary. It says, and then lastly, rejoice in the presence of the people God provides. Uh, as a church, we don't rejoice alone. We rejoice as a community. Now, this past week, we had an opportunity to eat a Thanksgiving meal, and boy, it was good. But we, the reason we rejoice as a community and eat some food and and eat some sweets and desserts and all of the sides is because we have an even greater reason to rejoice in Jesus Christ, our Lord and our Savior. And so can I invite you to cultivate an attitude of gratitude this Thanksgiving in your reverence of God by remembering the works of God, both in the word of God and also in your life this past year and throughout your life, and also make a choice to rejoice, not just this week or this coming Thursday, but every single day, giving glory to the God of our salvation. Can we pray? Father in heaven, 
our hearts are full of joy. We know that the reason we can, we can thank you in, in hard times and good times is because of who you are and what you've provided. Father, if there's someone here today who, who has never made Jesus their Savior, their Lord, that never received the forgiveness of sins or everlasting life in your name, I pray in this moment they can trust in you and receive that free gift by saying this prayer as a reflection of a heart that is genuine. Father, I recognize that, that I'm a sinner. I've fallen short. I've missed the mark. I'm deserving of your eternal wrath and I'm deserving of your eternal judgment, but I know that's why you sent Christ from heaven to earth to die in my place. At the cross, the wrath of God against my sin was satisfied, and Father, for that I am thankful. And the righteousness of Christ was, was transferred to my account, and for that I am thankful. Today I make Jesus my Savior. I make him my Lord, the one I'm going to follow all the days of my life into eternity. Father, there are so many reasons to tell you thank you. Father, we just give you all glory, honor, and praise for it all. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.